Fala pessoal, tudo bem? Rafael Duarte aqui. Bom, hoje a gente vai falar de sangramento gastrointestinal alto, hemorragia digestiva alta, ou do inglês, ou por the eye bleed. Fica até o final da aula, porque no final a gente vai rever pronúncia de termos e de palavras. Então o propósito dessa aula é fazer você aprender medicina interna, fazer você aprender clínica médica e ao mesmo tempo inglês médico. Tá bom? Let's get started! We're going to classify as upper GI bleeding, all bleeding from the esophagus, the stomach, duodenum, until the ligament of traits. Okay? Lower GI bleeding will be the bleeding from the colon. Okay? And all, everything in the middle has no classification actually. It's, it's going to be mid gut bleeding. Okay? The mortality of an upper GI bleed is 2 to 10 percent. Actually, 80 percent will stop bleeding spontaneously. And lower GI bleeding are less common and have lower mortality than upper. Okay? Just classifying some types of GI bleeding, we call overt GI bleeding, the bleeding that express clinically when the patient presents sterilization of blood and in the setting of upper GI bleeding it might be hematemesis which is a vomit with bright blood cells right it's a bright blood so sangue vivo and the upper GI bleed can present as a cough ground emesis like small amount of digested blood and the patient can vomit it also can present as melina or present rarely as hematochesia. But for an upper GI bleed, present as hematochesia, it should be above a liter of blood. So hematochesia, we have an abbreviation here to express that. It is bright red blood per rectum. We use this abbreviation a lot here to express hematochesia but it's mostly a manifestation of a lower GI bleed. If the upper GI bleed is so voluminous, above one liter, you can see bright red blood per rectum, okay? Occult GI bleeding, it is just a positive guaiac test, and obscure GI bleeding uh, is a patient with suspicion of GI bleeding, but the EGD esophageal gastric duodenoscopy and the colonoscopy are both negatives for bleeding. So most likely the patient has a mid gut bleeding and will benefit from a capsule. Okay? So in terms of presentation we saw that 30% will present with hematemesis, 20% with melina. So melina is that black stool with very particular and bad smell. In order to present with melina, the patient with upper GI bleed has to be, has to bleed at least 50 to 100 cc's or ml, okay? Another manifestation, as we said before, cough ground emesis, and rarely just 5% of patients with upper GI bleed will present as hematochesia, and in order to present like that, the volume of the blood has to be really large, okay, above a liter. In terms of etiology, we know that peptic ulcer disease and esophageal varices account for 8% of all cases of upper GI bleeding. So PUD is peptic ulcer disease and EV is esophageal varices, all right? So, uh, peptic ulcer disease mostly associated with NSAIDs use, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or H. pylori infection, right? And esophageal varices are mostly associated with portal hypertension in patients with cirrhosis. The third cause of upper GI bleed 
is Mallory Weiss tear. Other less common cause of upper DI bleed are cameron erosion. What's cameron erosion? When the patient has a hiatal hernia, so the folds of a hiatal hernia are mechanically damaged and the patient will have chronic low volume upper GI bleed. Usually it is not an overt GI bleed, but it's going to present as iron deficient anemia. GLA4 is, it is a French word. It is a dilated submucosal vessel. Dilated. And usually it's going to present with severe upper GI bleeding. Intermittent severe upper GI bleeding. Of course, upper GI tumors can bleed as well. Benign or malignant tumors, esophageal tumors, gastric tumors. And rare causes are oroenteric fistula. And we have to think about it in patients that have recent history of aortic surgery or prothesis displacement. So typically, those patients with oroenteric fistula, they you have something called herald bleeding. Herald bleeding é um sangramento sentinela. So the patient first will present a herald bleeding and then it's going to be followed by exsanguination. Okay? Hemosucos pancreaticos is when a pancreatic tumor or even a pancreatic pseudocyst they will erode the wall of a vessel and it's going to cause a bleeding inside the pancreatic duct. Either a tumor or pseudocyst presenting with upper GI bleed, you have to think about bleeding from the pancreatic ductus, which is called hemosucus pancreaticus. And hemobilia classically present with the triad of right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, and upper GI bleed, and it's caused by a traumatic lesion in the bile duct that's going to form, that's going to create a fistula between the bile duct and the branch of the hepatic artery. So this fistula can be created in the setting of trauma or even a liver biopsy. And the patient will present with colic pain, jaundice, and upper GI bleed. So those are rare cases of upper GI bleeding. We saw that 80% are caused by peptic ulcer disease or esophageal viruses. Okay, in terms of how to evaluate to assess a patient like that, you are receiving a patient with a history of upper GI bleed. So in terms of history, you have to look for uh, inset use or aspirin use, anticoagulants, antiplatelet medications, alcohol use, history of previous upper GI bleed or GI bleed, history of ulcer or varices, liver disease, coagulopathy, history of dysphagia, or even history of triple A repair. Triple A is abdominal aortic aneurysm. In terms of physical examination, basically we're gonna look for signs of hemodynamic instability, like heart rate above 100. Those are high risk patients, or even patients with hypotension, uh, systolic blood pressure lower than 90. Remember that hypertensive patients can have relative hypertension, right? So if a patient usually runs with systolic blood pressure of 160, when they present with 120, it might have, it might represent hypotension for that patient, okay? And remember uh, to search for postural hypotension. And keep in mind that young patients take too long to get hypotensive. Sometimes they are bleeding a lot, but they compensate well, they are tachycardic, but they are not hypotensive. Okay? When patients present with abdominal tenderness, peritonitis, you have to think about perforation, increased risk of aspiration, or massive hematemesis, vomiting blood. Those patients are patients that have to be intubated to protect and prevent blood aspiration. So sometimes we can't wait for the hemoglobin value to decide about transfusion. 
and sometimes the initial hemoglobin does not reflect the actual anemia. After the patient dilute, after you give fluids for the patient, you're gonna see the real hemoglobin. Okay, keep it in mind. I was admitting a patient like this, we're gonna do the type and screen, type and screen and typage sanguine. We're also gonna get the CMP, complete metabolic panel. Here we order the basic metabolic panel or complete metabolic panel. And it brings all together the BUN, que é a nossa ureia, the creatinine, and the electrolytes. Okay? LFTs, AST, AOT, coag test, INR, and PTT. We're gonna assure two Lord Bohr peripheral IV. You don't need a central IV. Peripheral IV is so much better than central IV. I'll show you. We're gonna do volume expansion with normal saline or AOR. So, sort of physiological, we call normal saline. And lactate ringer, AOR. Uh, we do not recommend NG tube lavage, which is nasogastric tube lavage. So it didn't show improved outcomes or, or help with the localization of the bleeding at all, so it's not recommended. And of course, admitting a patient with upper GI bleed, we keep the patient in Gieta Zero, which is called here NPO, nothing per oral, all right? Patient might need procedures. If you have a 14 gauge, you can run 333 cc's per minute. So you're gonna take less than two minutes to run 500 cc's of normal saline or AOR, okay? So a bag of a liter is gonna take three minutes at the most. So it's so much better than a central line. When you're assessing the patient in the emergence department, you don't know the etiology. You don't know the specific diagnosis, right? Of course, sometimes you have clues because sometimes the patient has already history of peptic ulcer disease or the patient is a cirrhotic patient with non sabida coincida non history of esophageal varices but if you're not sure about the diagnosis in the emergence department you're going to start PPI proton pump inhibitor like pantoprazole you give a bolus of 8 mg IV and then you're gonna keep the drip if the diagnosis was peptic ulcer disease with high risk patients that I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Also, you can start right away, right away, uh, immediately, right away. You can start octreotide, which is an explanking vasoconstrictor, right? So, octreotide, and of course, if you are suspecting of variceal bleeding in cirrhotic patients with portal hypertension, you're gonna give antibiotics as well to prevent SBP, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and also decreases the rate of rebleeding, the rebleeding risk. So if the patient is bleeding, you don't know the diagnosis, you're gonna do PPI, octreotide, and antibiotics, right? IV erythromycin. Remember that erythromycin is a prokinetic medication, right? It's not routinely prescribed or recommended. If the GI doctor that is gonna perform the endoscopy asks you to do erythromycin to help him with the procedure, then you do it to the patient. Vitamin K and protrombin complex concentrate. If the patient is using some anticoagulants, AC anticoagulants, or have high INR, especially INR greater than three. Of course, you're gonna avoid any delays, transfusion patients, or correcting INR if you need to do endoscopy right away, okay? And we also know that vitamin K dependent factors, two, seven, nine, and 10, it's gonna take some time, it's gonna take a while to correct them when you give vitamin K for the patient. It doesn't correct immediately. In order to correct immediately, you gotta give protrombin complex concentrate. And if the patient are using uh, DAPT for coronary disease, for example, DAPT, dual antiplatelet medication or therapy, or sometimes the patient is using just aspirin for primary prophylaxis, primary prevention, for now, you're gonna discontinue those medications. GC, 
is discontinued. De C could be discharge as well. Discontinue é suspender, né? Segurar a medicação. Put the medication on hold. Segurar. Discontinue. Em outro contexto, de C pode ser alta ou discharge. In terms of transfusion, when the patient has severe ongoing bleeding, you have to treat the patient like a trauma patient. So for every unit of PRBC, packet red blood cells, a unit of blood we call here PRBC, you're also going to give to the patient one unit of platelets and one unit of FFP. FFP is fresh frozen plasma. So if the patient is bleeding a lot and continuously, and of course you're not going to wait for hemoglobin to transfuse or to decide to transfuse these patients, you're going to transfuse right away in this proportion. One unit of blood, one unit of FFP, and one unit of platelet. Okay? Hypotensive patients also benefit from uh, immediate transfusion instead of wait for hemoglobin or something. And the target for transfusion, it's easy to remember because it's pretty much the magic number. To keep hemoglobin equal or above 7, considering that patient with coronary artery disease or severe comorbidities, you should transfuse the patient to keep hemoglobin above 8, 9. If the patient has coagulopathy, you're gonna give FFP, or even patients getting several units of blood, they dilute the coagulation factors, and you have to replace. So patients getting a lot of units of blood, you have to give FFP and platelets. If the patient was admitted and is bleeding, and the patient is thrombocytopenic, especially lower than 50, 50,000 platelets, you should transfuse platelets. And it's so frequent in patients with cirrhosis because they have portal hypertension, splenomegaly, they sequestrate platelets, and they consume platelets as well. Even before the EGD, we had some ways to stratify the patient. So one of the most famous scales to stratify the patients before an endoscopy, EGD, remember, is esophageal, gastric, duodenoscopy. One of the most famous is Glasgow Blatch 4 bleeding score. It takes into account the BUN, the hemoglobin, systolic blood pressure, heart rate, the presence of melina, syncope, cardiac or liver disease. And a very low risk patient can even be discharged and managed as outpatient. So the patient had a, let's say, a mild upper GI bleed at home and came to the emergency department the patient is not actively bleeding, you apply the Glasgow Blood for bleeding score and the score is 0 or 1, you can discharge the patient and you can manage the patient in the offs with upper endoscopy as outpatient. On the other hand, high risk patients has high risk of rebleeding. So the Blood for so the Glasgow Blood for bleeding score, it is able to predict the need for intervention, the risk of rebleeding and even the mortality. Another very simple scale to apply before the EGD is the AIM-65. It takes into account the albumin, INR, mental status, using the Glasgow Coma Scale lower than 15, systolic blood pressure lower than 90 and age greater than 65. So the more factors the patient gather. Now a brief discussion about the timing of the endoscopy. Because usually patients with upper GI bleeding, being admitted because of that, they get an endoscopy within 24 hours. But we have a couple of indications for urgent EGD, urgent endoscopy. And those are the patients basically with hemodynamic instability. So the patients after uh, hemodynamic resuscitation, patient that was before or is currently hemodynamically unstable, patient with hematemesis, vomiting bright blood, Patient, that's, patient that we suspect is active bleeding. Sometimes there is no overt bleeding, but we are transfusing the patient and hemoglobin is dropping. And patient with suspected variceal bleeding because it can be very severe and life-threatening bleeding. So patients suspecting of variceal bleeding, they will benefit from urgent endoscopy. And ulcers, features in the endoscopy, 
that tells us that the patient has high risk to re-bleed and should be kept on pantoprazol for 72 hours, kept in the drip. And when you have a solution going on through a pump, a drip, we also say that we have a solution in GTT. So GTT, when you see that here in the United States, it is a pump, it is a drip. And ulcers actively bleeding, forest one. Non-bleeding ulcers, but with visible vessel, high risk of bleeding still, forest 2A. Or intermediate risk, forest 2B, which is adherent clot ulcer. Those are manifestations that you can see in the endoscopy, and they warrant PPI, a drip of PPI for 72 hours. All right? So here we have the forest classification. Patient with peptic ulcer disease, we do the endoscopy, and we see the patient active bleeding. Active bleeding is forest one. If the patient have a spurting bleed, spurting as Johando, he will be forest 1A. If the bleed, if the patient is actively bleeding, but it's just woozing, babando sangue, it's going to be forest 1B. So forest 1, actively bleeding. Forest 1A, spurting. Forest 1B, woozing. Okay? So if those patients, forest 1, do not get an endoscopy or are not treated endoscopically, they will re-bleed in a range of 55%. Okay? Forest 2 is not actively bleeding, but you can see the vessel. There is a visible vessel. And this patient and this patient is still a high risk of re-bleeding and should get endoscopic treatment. Forest 2B the endoscopist will see a adherent clot. So most of them will wash out the clot and examine the base of the ulcer and go from there. So some of these patients will be treated and some of them will not. So both are forest 2. Forest 2 way, the endoscopist can see the vessel and forest 2B, the endoscopist will see a clot. Forest 2C and forest tree, 2C will be pigmented spot, and forest tree, a clean base, they don't need to be treated endoscopically at this time, okay? Because the risk of rebleeding is too low, right? Here you can see again, forest one, actively bleeding, even spurting, sangramento in jato, or woozing, babando, even with the endoscopic treatment, the patient can rebleed in 50% of cases. Here is forest 2A. The endoscopist will see just the vessel, but should get endoscopic treatment. Here you see just the clot. The endoscopy most of the time will wash out the clot and assess the base of the ulcer. So those patients here will benefit from endoscopic treatment now and those are the high and those are the high risk patients that will be kept in a drip of PPI for 72 hours. All right? Patients for 2C or for 3 don't need treatment because they have very low risk of rebleeding. Mallory Weiss tear is a longitudinal laceration in the distal esophagus or proximal stomach, usually it's gonna happen when the intraabdominal pressure suddenly increases. Okay? The typical history is a patient drinking alcohol, using alcohol, and the patient is vomiting a lot and retching. Retching. Retching é aquela sensação de você fazer o, a ânsia de vômito, mas não vomitar. It's retching. It increases the abdominal pressure a lot. Usually it has a good prognosis. Usually patient will not need transfusion. It's going to resolve by its own using PPIs. But it might be severe. It might bleed a lot. It might cause esophageal rupture. But usually it doesn't happen. Okay? Other causes of increased abdominal pressure, like trauma, seizures, 
other than alcohol use, vomiting and retching, can also precipitate mallory wise tear. But the typical history, especially in questions, are alcohol use, vomiting, uh, retching, and the patient start having like a mild to moderate upper GI bleed. Esophageal varices. This one is scary because it can bleed a lot already with coagulopathy, high INR and thrombocytopenic. So those patients bleed a lot. Okay? So the risk factors. Remember that the patient with portal hypertension, let's say the patient has cirrhosis, the patient will try to create their own shunts to bypass the liver since there is high resistance to the flow of the blood uh, through the liver. And one of these bypass, these natural bypasses, is the esophageal varices. Remember that the left gastric vein drains into the portal vein, so this vessel gets really dilated. Okay? And some of the features that tells us that the varices are really risky to bleed, to rupture and bleed, is varices greater than 5 millimeters, varices in patients, child pugue. Remember that classification of decompensation in cirrhotic patients? So child pugue B or C have high risk of bleeding. And also the presence of red spots in the varices. And we can clearly see the red spots here. The sulfate varices can be classified as F1. They are small and straight, headless and straight. F2, enlarged and tortuous like this one, but occupying less than one third of the lumen of the esophagus. Or F3, like this one in this image, occupying more than one third of the circumference of the esophagus. Look at this spurting bleeding. Even before the final diagnosis, you have to give, you have to give octreotide, which is explaining the vasoconstrictor. We're gonna give 50 micrograms in bolus, followed by 50 micrograms per hour in drip, even after the endoscopy, 48, 72 hours afterwards, you're gonna keep the uh, octreotide infusion after the ligation, after the varices were bended, okay? So there's no other treatment. The patient will get the splanking vasoconstrictor and endoscopy to get ligation, to get the varices bended. And it's very important to remember, sometimes we forget because it's not straightforward to think about antibiotics in a patient bleeding. But upper GI bleeding put the cirrhotic patients in risk for uh, infections, especially SBP, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And even the rebleeding rate you can decrease by giving the patient antibiotics. You can usually give fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin or nofloxacin, but most of the time at this point you're going to give third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone. Because this patient is critically ill most of the time, or the patient might be intubated and unable to swallow, so you give ceftriaxone and then you can transition to uh, fluoroquinolones. So here you can see esophageal varices bended. And when you bend a patient, you're going to repeat endoscopy every two to four weeks to bend another varices. And when you're done and completely bended everything, all the esophagus will form actually scars and then when you're done with that you're going to repeat the endoscopy in six months and then in 12 months to follow the procedure to follow the esophageal varices. No selective beta blockers should be given to this patient with esophageal varices after the stabilization, days afterwards. So forget about those right now, okay? Remember, for primary prophylaxis, the patient has esophageal varices and they never bled. You have to choose between non-selective beta blocker or uh, endoscopic bending, ligation of the varices. But for secondary prophylaxis, which means the patient bled in life, the patient bled before, you have to give birth to the patient. Non-selective beta blocker, most of the time it's going to be corvedilol, but you can use, of course, propranolol or nandolol. And the goal, the target of the heart rate, it's going to be around 55 to 60 beats per minute. 
but not in this acute setting. This patient after esophageal bleeding, do you need secondary prophylaxis with both non-selective beta blocker and ligation? But non-selective beta blocker will give later on, not now. I always remember that patient with portal hypertension, if you give too much fluids or if you do overtransfusion, the patient can increase the portal pressure and they can rebleed. So be careful with that. If you have a patient with esophageal varices and the patient is bleeding a lot, you may need something called the uh, Sunstake in Blackmore balloon as a bridge to the endoscopy. It's kind of a dramatic situation. Rarely works well. You insert this uh, catheter with two balloons, the esophageal and the gastric balloon, and you have to make sure it's well positioned before you inflate them under the risk of esophageal rupture. Uh, and you put a heavy thing here to pull those structure. And of course the patient have to be intubated. It's just a bridge into the endoscopy. And if the patient is re-bleeding and is unstable, you have to think about emergent CHIPS. CHIPS stands for transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt. It's basically the interventional radiology. They come from the jugular vein uh, into the IVC, inferior vena cava, and we will radioscopically look for a branch of the portal vein and you try to create a shunt and place a stent linking the portal vein to the hepatic artery, decompressing the portal vein and alleviating the pressure here in the esophageal varices. Okay, it's a very dramatic situation under the risk of hepatic encephalopathy because you're shunting the blood uh, around the liver, right? So if the patient with variceal hemorrhage, they are stable and they re-bleed, you can repeat the endoscopy. And if the endoscopy is unable to stop the bleeding, you can also think about chips or even angiography and embolization. After endoscopy approaching the end of this lecture, low-risk patients can be fed, can podem ser alimentados. They get on daily PPI if they diagnose this peptic ulcer disease because PPI doesn't bring any benefits for virus seal bleeding. They can actually increase the risk in cirrhotic patients for C. diff infection, for example. So you have to think about the uh, side effects of PPI as well. But usually low-risk patients can be fed. They can be discharged with on daily PPI. High-risk patients for peptic ulcer disease will be kept in a drip of PPI for 72 hours. And if the patient had actually variceal hemorrhage, you're gonna keep, instead of PPI for 72 hours, octreotide for 72 hours. Let's just go word by word and expression by expression to train the pronunciation. So say the word with me so you can learn how to say them, okay? So, overt. Occult, hematemesis, hematemesis, é como se fosse um acento circunflexo aqui no E, hematemesis, melina, melina é como se você não pronunciasse esse E aqui, pronunciasse só o M, e o estresse da palavra está aqui, no LI, melina, hematoquígia, hematoquígia, Ok? Aqui está o estresse da palavra. Hematoquísia. Esophageal varices. So, a gente vai pronunciar o S como S mesmo. Esophageal. Esophageal. And em português, varices. Varizes é. Varizes. O estresse está no I. Aqui é varices. So, esophageal varices. Mallory Weiss tear. Or Mallory Weiss tear. Cameron erosion. This is a hard one. Hiatal hernia. Hiatal, hiatal hernia. Dilated. Aberrant. Massive. Herald. So the stress is here. 
But this A will be pronounced like an O. Herald. É o sangramento sentinela. Herald. This is easy because it's exactly as it is written. Exsanguination. Hemorrhage. Hemorrhage. The stress is here. Hemorrhage. Duct. Hemobilia. It's very similar to hemoglobin. Hemobilia. Caused. Não é caused. É caused. É como se isso aqui fosse pronunciado como um T. E o stress está aqui. Caused. Anticoagulant. Anticoagulant. Antiplatelets. A gente fala plaquetas. Mas aqui é platelets. O stress está no pla, no play. Pertinitis. Lavage. 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 That's a weird word. Lavage. That's a hard one because it's gauge. It's like that. Gauge. Gauge. Octreotide. Octreotide. Endoscopy. The stress is here. E é como se tivesse um acento agudo aqui. Endoscopy. Life threatening. Uma situação que ameaça a vida. Life threatening. Adherent. Sporting bleed. Sporting. E esse ting aqui will be pronounced like ring. Spurring. Spurring bleed. É o sangramento em jato, né? O sangramento volumoso. Mucosal. Mucosal. Esophagus. So, o S vai realmente ter som de S. É como se tivesse um acento agudo aqui. Esophagus. Esophagus. Stomach. Stomach. Não é stomach, é stomach. Ok, pessoal? Então é isso. Espero que vocês tenham gostado. Espero que vocês tenham aprendido medicina sobre sangramento gastrointestinal alto e também aprendido siglas, abreviações, inglês médico e pronúncia. Vejo você em breve. Música